Welcome to Wounded for War, featuring the Bible teaching of Phil Santo. This broadcast is an online video teaching through the Bible to help people rethink Jesus and his mission, to seek out the hurt, the lost, and the broken. So grab your favorite drink and a seat and join us as we start today's talk. Hey guys, welcome back. We are uh, today going to cover 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and it's going to be verses 1 through 5. We're, we're going to be talking about um, the difference of being spiritually empowered versus uh, man's techniques and, and man's way. And, uh, you know, what we'll see is in, in the section Paul has learned and grown uh, from where he first started in his Christian walk and then moved into maturity. And, and there's a distinct area that changes everything as far as what you experience in life. How you, uh, how you actually get through some of the toughest things you'll ever deal with. And I think <laughs> in 2021, we're all going to need that, right? So let's dive in. Well, it's been said that you can either make a point with people or you can make an impact, right? And I, maybe you've heard that saying before. And, uh, you know, in today... Uh, today's age, people really don't care about making impact. They just want to be heard. They want to make a point. They want to, they want to, you know, spout out their truth and and just hammer it into you because they want their reality to be everyone's reality. And and that's just not um, very real. It's not. It's not true. Everyone has uh, their own ways of doing life. But Paul, he's learned something becoming into Christianity. He went from one way of thinking to another way of thinking. I want to ask today that you would, uh, though you have your ways of life, your things that you do that, that allow you to live the way you want, I want to challenge you to think beyond those things for a moment and to think it in, in light of what we're about to hear, I want you to, to question yourself, to ask, where am I in the story? Am I Paul? Am I some of the people that he'll argue with? Am I uh, Paul early in life or am I Paul later in life? So let's dive in, take a look at what Paul uh, has to say. In verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of of God to you. I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit of power, so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. So, the very first thing we see in, in verse 1 and 2, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided, however, to know nothing among you except for Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You know, Paul didn't come to share uh, the gospel in the way that the Greeks uh, really were used to. These were people that that uh, honestly they valued. Uh, it was well, it was it was the epicenter. Corinth was the epicenter for for great oratory and and philosophy and and uh, you know and thought right, but. The, these guys weren't quite uh, like you and I, where you know, where we want to sit and, and contemplate something, find the truth in it, and, and bring it into our life. No, they they actually did this because uh, they were known for the style. It wasn't necessarily about the content of the message. You know, they were actually they were more into the way something was said rather than what it, the person actually said. 
it was about style. These guys were were speaking in a way that uh, essentially got so famous that uh, people used to say sayings like, uh, he speaks in the way of a Corinthian. And what that meant was, is that there was kind of flavor of like, you know, to it. There was color to it. Um, they were articulate. These guys were precise. They had flair, we might say today, right? And, and so they were super into the polished uh, preacher or the, the polished philosopher, the one that spoke in such a manner that was so impressive. Paul specifically says, I didn't come to you that way. Paul, Paul didn't come to them that way, um, but he could have, in a sense. It does say that he wasn't a great speaker, but one thing he had was knowledge. You know, uh, in this area, Paul actually, it says that, for I decided, in verse 2, for I decided to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. If that's all you had as your tools in your tool bag of things to choose from, then no big deal, but that's not Paul. You see, Paul um, actually had quite a bit of knowledge. He was um, in, in Philippians chapter 3. It says where his background is. And it actually explains he knows a lot more probably than any one of these people know about Christ who had come into the city and tried to share the gospel. You know, it says in, in verse Philippians 3, verse 4, latter half, I would say, uh, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding righteousness that is in the law, blameless. So he has all the credentials of the day. He was taught by Gamaliel, the best teacher around. He had the knowledge. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had already memorized books, the first five books of the Bible. Yet, he says, as he goes on, in verse 7, he says, But everything that was gained to me, I considered to be loss for Christ. I like the other version. It says, but rubbish. Oh, wait, no. There's a comma in there. It's but rubbish. <laughs> so, as Paul had this great knowledge, he says, I tossed it all. I was trained by the best people. But Paul learned to value just bringing a simple gospel. You ever try and convince people about your faith or, or your uh, atheism? <laughs> uh, Paul tossed away all the tools that he had in his belt and put one in there. And that was the simple gospel. You see, Paul knew something. He knew that uh, the gospel itself is sufficient. He'll go on to say in other books that uh, the, the gospel is a very power for salvation. He says, because of that, I'm not afraid to preach just that. For I decided. He had a choice. And he chose right. We'll see. Paul didn't start here, however, in Acts 9, we see an arrogant Paul. I know a lot about this. It reminds me of myself in my earlier years of, of ministry. You see, we'll take a look at this. Acts 9. If you don't know this uh, area, man, this is a great uh, er a set of scriptures because it, it tells you how the guy who wrote the majority of the Bible went from a non-believer to a believer. And as a new believer, he started preaching because he's a zealot. This guy is on fire, man. You can't stop these type of people. He's a type A personality, right? And so in Acts chapter 9, 
uh, 19 through 30 is what I would say uh, we should take a look at. And we see how he started preaching, okay? Acts 9, 19. And he starts by saying this. Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some time. Immediately, he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues. He went straight. Uh, it's like, you know, I, I started playing baseball. and I went straight to the major leagues, <laughs> right? That's what he's doing here. He went to the synagogues. He is the son of, uh, uh, sorry, G, uh, he, he came immediately began preaching Jesus in the synagogues. He is the son of God. All who heard him were astounded and said, isn't this the man in Jerusalem who was causing havoc for those who called on his name? and came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests. But Saul grew stronger and kept confounding. Note that word, confounding. And he kept confounding them. Who, the Jews who lived in Damascus, by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had passed, the Jews conspired to kill him. So, He's not being fruitful. This guy's confounding people. He's, he's basically uh, proving to them that Jesus is the Messiah. But the thing is, that didn't cause converts. As a matter of fact, uh, they weren't following him to learn from him. They were following him to kill him. It goes on to say that, uh, but Saul learned of their plot. So they were watching the gates day and night to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the wall. When he had arrived at Jerusalem, now he's in a new place, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid. Since they did not believe he was a disciple, Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the, to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that uh, the Lord had talked to him. And how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul was coming and going with them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He conversed and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. Then the brothers found out. They took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Now, this guy comes flying out of the gate as a brand new Christian, starts arguing, confounding. He's, he wants to make a point. You know anybody like that? They just want to be right. That's how he was. They wanted to kill him for that. It didn't persuade anybody. It didn't, um, it didn't change their heart. You ever heard the saying, uh, so, what is it? It's uh, a, a man, oh shoot, what is it? Uh, uh, there's a, an old saying that says something of the nature, God, well, getting old sucks. It's uh, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Took me a minute, we got there. But you notice here, it says, so the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace. Now, they just tossed him out. They, they said, dude, you're going to Tarsus. You're getting out of here. But now throughout this whole land, he's, there's peace. And they were strengthened. Living, this is going to be important, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Increased in number. The whole church grew. Why? Because they were living in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. That word fear, I know, nobody wants to live in fear of anything, right? But here's the thing. That word originally, uh, in the original language, means reverence. They reverenced the Lord. They had a, 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 a healthy fear of the Lord. And coupled with that was the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. You know, probably the best combo, it's kind of like a parent, right? 
they put that healthy fear in you and they, they let you know, hey, you can't just do life your own way. You'll destroy yourself. You'll eat sugar until you, you puke and have diabetes at four years old. You'll, you'll you know, uh, drink soda and chips and, and you'll just do the things that bring pleasure. Isn't that true? We don't go for non-pleasurable things. We shoot for pleasure. From the get-go, you don't even need to train your kids that way. They just know it. But it's destructive. And so there's also a, a part of the parent, though, that comforts, right? When we discipline our kids specifically, I, when they were younger, I would spank them on the bottom, and then I would sit them on my lap, and I would hug them. Even if they were squirming and wanted out, I would hug them and hold them until they softened and leaned in. And then I would explain why I had to do that and remind them that I love them. Because it's out of love that I'm doing this so that you remember there are hard consequences in life for doing the wrong thing. That's what these people had learned. And they grew. You want to grow in your walk with Christ? Those are two things we all need to gain. We're going to see that Paul had gained them because his early years, he's arrogant as, as, can, as can be. You know, it goes on and says that, that uh, in verse 3, actually, let's read. Let's read it again real quick. In verse 3 of 1 Corinthians, it says this. It says, I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Paul somehow had been softened. And what's interesting about that is that he had just gone through a long series of getting his but handed to him. You see, he, he starts out in Galatia a while back before this trip, and he got super sick, really bad. Then he, he moves on. He has this dream that from this guy in Macedonia says, come and, and, and teach us. So he, he leaves, and he's going to Macedonia. But what happens on his way in Philippi, he's, he's attacked, he's grabbed, and thrown in prison and beaten. That's not fun. This guy's going through a hard time. And then after that, as he leaves there, he goes through Thessalonica, he goes through Berea, and he ran into riots and, and just all kinds of havoc. You wonder why he says, you know, I came to you in this way of, of a weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. He came out a changed man. Talk about PTSD, man. If, if I was him, after having, you know, he, he has a list of things that he, he went through in another book, and it says that essentially that he uh, sleepless, he was stoned to death. We are in Washington. That is not, that is people throwing rocks at you. But this guy, he's, he's, he's been through the gamut. He's got to have PTSD, man. I know in my own walk of all the things that I've gone through in ministry that will leave me with PTSD. It's, it's gnarly. But what it does do, it, it shapes you. If you allow the Lord to use these hard circumstances in your life, if you surrender them to Him, He'll actually turn it around for your good and His glory. Whether you have PTSD or have to take medications from, because of whatever ailment you have that come from walking with Jesus, you know, he came out a changed man. Much more humble than the first encounter in Acts 9. He came in weakness. Before it says, I came boldness. Now he's coming in weakness. You know, man, 
he had the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. There was a season in between that time where he was cast out into a desert for 13 years. You know, we're going through a very desert type season. In that season, Paul met with the Lord over and over and over. He, he cared for him. The Holy Spirit comforted him somehow. We don't get the details, but I can tell you my own walk. We've been through a lot. If you've followed this channel for, for long, uh, you know my story. It's a really, really rough one. I'm sure there's plenty out there, but it's not uh, growing up with uh, Leave it to Beaver life. This was more of uh, the Adams family gone wild. You know, I don't know. How <laughs> it, it was rough. <laughs> it was really rough. But he was comforted by the Holy Spirit. And so can you. So can I. I've experienced those moments where the Lord has shaped my heart and shaped my life in a new way, softening me to things that I was really hard to before, breaks you down, makes you trust in Him. As a matter of fact, he goes on and he says, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the power the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. So, he's not trusting in his knowledge anymore. He's not trusting in his ability anymore. What's he trusting in? He's trusting in the gospel message, simply as he put, but empowered by the Spirit of God. Do you want that for your own life? The comfort? The empowerment, it comes with the fear, reverence, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you in due time, the scriptures say. Paul wants us to do this, he says, as he goes on in verse 5, so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. You know, as I said before, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Or uh, sometimes, you know, if I can convince you into something, someone else can convince you out of it. But when God convinces you of something and breaks you and then builds you back up, you're left with a very solid foundation. You recognize God's hand upon your life and this world. He says, uh, who can snatch you out of my hand? Nobody. Who can harm you? If the Lord is for you, who could be against you? Are you going to face adversity? Without question, Paul did. But at least you have an advocate. Someone who will go to bat for you. I've seen multitude of times where my company, uh, when I was uh, back, I don't know, five, six years, at a fairly large company, and and uh, it was weird because I had a bunch of people uh, rob me while my wife was sick and I was helping my family. And, uh, and the Lord, I thought I was done for. And I just put it to prayer. And the Lord brought some people. In the middle of the night, one guy said his wife woke up and had us on his heart. And literally that the Lord had told them to help us financially. This guy didn't even know me. He knew about me, knew about my situation. He didn't even know me. He called, got my number and called me and said, hey, I heard about your situation. How much money do you need to get back on track for your business? I said over 100,000. He wrote a check for 100,000. It was mind boggling. Never needed to pay it back. It was just here, man. God told me to do it in the middle of the night. Those things don't just happen. That's when we humble ourselves before the Lord. 
when we're broken. I was broken. And I had a reverence and I was crying out to God. And he met me there. This season's been hard for all of us. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're broken. If you are, I would invite you to cry out to God. Don't be Paul in his early years. Come to the Lord in a fashion where you humble yourself. And say, Lord, I just want your life for me rather than the mess this has all been. I want your comfort. I want to love you and you love me back. I don't want to be lonely anymore. I want to be at peace, even in chaos. I'm going to pray and uh, close us out. But I would, I would, without question, encourage you to uh, agree with this prayer from your heart to God. And let this be your cry out to Him. Father, I love that in the scriptures it says that we can cry out, Abba, Father, and that word means Daddy, intimate. You want us to be like a child to our daddy, you. Lord, help us to rely on you in this season. Help us to turn to you if we've never turned to you. Lord, I pray that you would please help my, my brothers and my sisters, the people out there, Lord, that are going to watch this video. I pray that we would all be reminded by Paul that it's about Jesus and him crucified. Raised from the dead so that we don't have to pay that penalty. Literally, Lord, you went on that cross instead of me so that I could have a righteousness from you so that I could stand before the Father and enjoy peace and strength. And you left your Holy Spirit with empowerment. Lord, I need that. We need that. Please empower us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would uh, turn hearts of many to yourself. Lord, I'm praying for the Pacific Northwest for revival. And I pray, Lord, that it would not be because of my eloquent words, or wisdom, but that you would help us all to trust in you and your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for all that you've done for me, for my brothers and sisters. I pray, God, that you would continue to mature us like Paul from the beginning to maturity, where he's arrogant turd turned into a, a man who trusts in you and ends up writing the majority of the Bible used by you, weak and trembling. Thank you, Lord. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If this message uh, really hits you between the eyes, go ahead and message me. Uh, inst you know, you can instant message me through uh, either Facebook Messenger or you know go ahead and, and comment on YouTube and uh, let me know so I can be praying for you. I have a little prayer list that I just keep by my side at all times and, I, and I'm praying for people constantly. We've seen in this uh, year and a few months that I've been doing these videos I've seen a large thousands of people um, affected by it. And a few really stand out. There's been a couple people that went from suicide to full flourishing. Man. Another one uh, was a, a shut-in in, in their house, and now, uh, and they were in fear because they had been abused. And uh, now they're bold, but not in a bad way. They're actually going out and, and sharing their story. So. 
I want you to experience that same thing. So please hit me up. And uh, if you want, even put your number and I'll pray with you. Or just your name and uh, what to pray for, whatever. And I'll pray for you. Love you guys. Until next week. Read ahead. Uh, right after chapter uh, 2, verse uh, 5 is verse 6. Read through. Get to know it a little bit. And uh, join us back on next Sunday. Love you guys. Bye.